one person paying attention in 500, the odds when you get when you get down to 20, your odds start shrinking pretty quick. So uh, anyway, all right, Second Kings six. Second Kings six. I'm glad Mr. Keith uh, filled in for me last week, and it was literally last second. Uh, I came here. I know it didn't feel great, but I thought I'd, and I knew how it was going to end. <laughs> uh, I just thought I'd had more time before it ended that way, and uh, then I had that twinge in my stomach that said, nope. And so, uh, anyway, we weren't able to make it through, but uh, so we're behind, and we're going to try and catch up a little bit. Second Kings 6, <clears throat> uh, we're actually in verse 18. Uh, we're looking at uh, some things about Elisha's miracle. We've seen it, the axe head floating. And now um, let's just back up and start reading in verse 8 as we familiarize ourselves with what's going on again because it's been a couple of weeks. <clears throat> it says, Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him, and thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself on more, uh, more than once or twice. And so <clears throat> he was giving them, uh, Elijah, or Elisha was giving the king, the wicked king of the north, heads up not to go to certain places. Now you remember when you look at the end of this section in verse 23, this isn't really about all-out wars, it's about raids. They would go on raids and kind of capture cities and and weak places, maybe not cities so much as villages, right? The cities had the walls, created a whole different dynamic, but you would raid villages quite a bit and kind of take advantage of those uh, particular places. <clears throat> so, um, verse 11, the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing, and he called his servants and said to him, will you not show me who is for the king of Israel? So he's under the impression, and you can kind of see why he's under the impression, that he's got a spy in his camp. It's the only way he can know this. The king of Israel can consistently know his moves before he does. And um, so he's starting to, uh, he thinks that there's a spy in the camp. And then verse 12, and one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. And it was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. That's about 12 miles north of Samaria. So he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, we talked about this when we went through it, but, uh, you know, that's a pretty foolish move on his part. If you just practice common sense, that's foolish. He can tell you what you speak in your bedroom. You haven't had a successful raid in months because he keeps telling the king of Israel, and you think you're going to catch him off guard by going and surrounding where he is. You think he doesn't see you coming? I mean... I don't know, maybe I'm just strange. Well, I mean, I know that's true, but uh, that just seems completely asinine to me. So when the servant of the man of God arose early <clears throat> in the morning and went out, and behold, the army and the horses and the chariots were all around the city, the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, <clears throat> for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So... You, you kind of put yourself in uh, the servant's shoes here. And by the way, the Bible has a, it has a comedic element to it, okay? Um, we're actually going to run into another comedic element here in just a minute. But um, <clears throat> this is kind of funny to me because here he is and he said, we're surrounded. And Elisha says, we've got more people with us than they've got with them. And you can almost see the servant go, what are you seeing? I don't see it. This doesn't look, you know, you're not making sense. Verse 17, then Elisha prayed and said, oh, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, a mountain, <clears throat> the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The angelic army is there protecting him. The same angelic army that, that gave Elijah an escort into heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2. So, verse 18, and when the Syrians came down against him, that is, they started to 
come and uh, try and seize Elisha. Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way and this is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. Now that's funny to me. (laughs) That is very funny to me. They go blind and he walks right up to the guy who's, who's coming for his life and says, hey, you're in the wrong place. Now, this is the guy he's looking for, and he says, hey, you're in the wrong place, but I'll take you to him. <laughs> and then he marches a strand of elite soldiers right into the capital city of Israel and says, okay, Lord, open their eyes now and let them see. Here, he, I mean, he's, he's just he's making a clown out of them. He, he's treating them like a circus act, uh, just showing just how foolish Uh, it is to try and fight back against God in verse 20 it says and so as they entered Samaria Elisha said O Lord open the eyes of these men that they may see so the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold they were in the midst of Samaria as soon as the king of Israel saw them he said to Elisha my father shall I strike them down shall I strike them down he answered you shall not strike them down would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow and so he brings them in and now the king of Israel wants to know what should I do? Should I execute them? Now, this may be coming from, you remember, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 21, when the king of Israel was told to kill the king of Syria, and he let him off. He negotiated a deal, and that's what sealed the deal for Ahab's fate. God said, okay, then your life is going to go for his. And so you can, perhaps this king is aware of that history, and uh, so he's thinking, okay, maybe I need to make sure of what I need to do here. And so it may be a moment where he's um, exercising some good judgment and some good sense, some spiritual sense uh, in what's going on. <clears throat> and so Elisha answers and says, no, don't strike them down. He said, and his reasoning is what? When you capture people normally in battle, you don't just kill them. You just, they become captives and they work for you. So why would you do that to people that you absolutely did not capture? I just walked them right into your gates. And so then he says, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. Now, why does he feed them? You know, there are ways of humiliating people, right? And one of the ways you can humiliate people is to pulverize them and drive them into the ground. The other way you can humiliate people is to make a mockery of them. It's two approaches. They're all tried. They're all used. You can look throughout history and see where people used both approaches. Um... On this occasion, this is a a sense of humiliation. I'm actually just going to cook for you and send you home. And then when you have to explain to your king what happened, how's that going to go? I don't have to hurt you. I'll humiliate you, send you home, and then you, when you explain that you were the man that you were sent to arrest and kill led you into the middle of the capital and then they fed you a meal and you didn't even try and fight back what do you think is going to happen to him you won't live long and so God is delivering Elisha yet again from the hands of people who seek his life he's showing his superiority he's also showing um, showing grace to the king of Israel and I got to tell you as I the more I read especially in 2nd Kings 1st Kings it's there certainly but the more I read in 2nd Kings the more I keep thinking to myself over and over again how gracious God is with people who are flat out opposed to him 
because these kings are flat out opposed to them. Like they're not, it's not like they're worshiping their idols and worshiping God at the same time. Now that happened. Judah fell into that problem. Okay, they would worship <clears throat> their idols and they would worship God in the temple at the same time. That's Jeremiah 7 and, and countless other texts in the prophets. But the people of Israel didn't even try. I mean, it was um, a full-scale abandonment of God and going only toward idolatry. But God is hes being extremely gracious with them. I mean, why not send this invading force into Samaria and kill the king? Or take more things away from the king? He's providing opportunities. He's giving him intelligence that he could not get on his own. He's giving him deliverance that he can't get on his own. And so it's just interesting to me how gracious God is with people who are disobedient. Now, it shouldn't be surprising because that's the story of every one of us, right? That's Romans 5, 6 through 8. And while we're sinners, Christ dies for us. It's not uh, that we're good men or righteous men and women that, that he died, when he dies for us. We're sinners. We're in opposition. We're enemies. We hated God. Those are all words that are used to describe us in Romans 5. So, <clears throat> There are no more raids in the land of Israel, and part of the reason may be because they were humiliated, because they're coming back. The Syrians are now coming back with their king, and it's going to be a larger scale offensive now. Okay, So in verse 24, it says, Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army, so no raid, this is full-fledged invasion, and went up and besieged Samaria. So what happens when, what does, what do we mean by besieging? What is happening here? We see it a lot in the Bible. What does it mean to besiege a city? I'm sorry? Pretty much. It's just basically encircling the city. Uh, it may be some little assaults here and there, just kind of nibble at them a little bit, uh, launch some things at their walls, try and penetrate every now and then, but nothing. You're basically just waiting them out. Okay? Walls were your protection. I mean, if you, if you were over a city, you had to have walls. Otherwise, you were a sitting duck. But your vulnerability with walls was somebody could lock you in there, and then you're done. Um, you got to get water. Your food in the city will only last for so long. Um, and so basically, they just kind of uh, starve you out. Now, this is a... <clears throat> It happened a lot in Bible times, but you know, it, it happened, it's happened a lot in, in recent history. Uh, my home state in Mississippi, the Battle of Vicksburg, they besieged the city. That's, that's how they won the battle. That's how the Union won the Battle of Vicksburg. They just besieged it and starved them out. Um, let's see. When Russia invaded Ukraine in the early 20th century, they used this same tactic. When the Nazis went against Leningrad, they used the same tactic. Um, and so it's effective. If you, if you are patient enough to see it through and you've got the resources to outlast them, it's an extremely effective method. And so <clears throat> here they are coming against Samaria. In verse 25 it says, and there was a great famine in Samaria. So a besieging is hard enough to endure when things have gone well, but they've also been struggling with a famine, which means they probably don't have a lot of extra rations either, okay? So they're <clears throat> running into a couple issues, and it says, as they besieged it, until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and four parts of a cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. Okay, now I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> the Bible speaks about besieging, and it is very ugly. And God is, is showing reality of what happens in these situations. So a donkey's head is sold for 80 shekels of silver. Now to put that in perspective, in Solomon's time, an entire donkey was 150 shekels of silver. The head alone, which, I mean, I'm not an expert in that kind of thing. I've never eaten a donkey's head and don't really want to, but I'm going to guess 80 shekels is probably a lot for a donkey's head. Okay? Then, when you add on top of that, a fourth part of a cab of dove's dung, five shekels of silver. 
So we're eating animal excrement. People say, no, that can't be what it means. Well, hold on just a second. Go over to chapter 18 when the king of Assyria, not Syria, but Assyria, he is threatening to besiege the city of Judah and actually does besiege it. He just doesn't take the city. But when he's trying to convince Judah to submit, he says this in 1827. It says, But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall, who are doomed to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine? Look, that's unpleasant for us to think about, but that's common knowledge of people who lived and understood what besieging was. You ran out of food. And the desperation of hunger, which... I'm going to venture to say probably not many of us have ever known at this level. Um, things get desperate. You know, there's not a NATO ally that can drop food supplies into the city for you. You're done. And you can go through and you can read history and other things and see how hunger psychologically breaks a person. And that when you're... you're People, you know, we recall that and say, there's no way I could ever. Listen, when your existence depends upon it, when your life depends upon something, you can do things you never thought you could. And um, that's kind of how this is getting. And so it goes even further, and it's going to get uglier. So in verse 26, it says, Now as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help me. Uh, my lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? I've got nothing to offer you. If God has cut off our natural resources through a famine and then we're besieged, I can't do anything to help you. And the king asked her, what is your trouble? She answered, this woman said to me, give me your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day I said to her, give your son that we may eat him but she has hidden her son. And when the king heard the words of this woman, he tore his clothes. Now, he, as he was passing by on the wall, the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath his body. So they've resorted to cannibalism. The Old Testament speaks of this actually quite a bit. Um, it speaks of it in Ezekiel, it speaks of it in Lamentations, but I want you to look at Deuteronomy 28 with me for just a minute. Deuteronomy 28, this is... <clears throat> the section where you remember that uh, God is speaking of the curses of the law that will come upon them, okay? Now, sometimes people are troubled by this, and, and they say, is God saying that he's going to make them to where they eat their own children? No, that's not the point. What God is saying is he's going to allow an enemy to come to them. And the natural consequence of that enemy coming to them is to participate in all different types of atrocities, okay? So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, we're going to begin in uh, 52. Uh, it says, They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in distress with which your enemy shall distress you. The man who is most tender and refined among you will, be, will begrudge food to his brother and the wife he embraces. Hunger gets so strong that <clears throat> we're, hiding it not, we're hiding it from our family members. Okay, Delicate men who would never imagine touching certain things, they're willing to eat certain things and they're willing to hide them from the wife that he embraces and to the last of his children who he has left so that he will not give any of them any of the flesh of his children whom he is eating because he has nothing else left in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies will distress you in all your towns the most tender and refined woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because she is so delicate and tender what is he saying? A lady who won't even get her feet dirty. We might consider it like ultimate princess mentality. Like, I don't do sweat and I don't do dirt. People like that. 
<clears throat> okay? Because she is so delicate and tender, will begrudge the husband she embraces to her son and to her daughter, her afterbirth that comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears. Because she is lacking everything, she will eat them secretly in the siege and in the distress with which your enemy will distress you in your towns. Now, God had told them all along what was going to happen if they forsook it. And these are grotesque and they are ugly images. Um, and you notice right here that the woman, the woman's gripe is not that they had to kill their son, their children, and eat them. That's not her complaint. What is it? She won't share. She reneged on the deal. That's her problem. And so it shows you a, a sense of desperation which is, well, it's, it's almost flat out impossible for me to fathom. Um, but it shows you the, the dire consequences. This is what happens when you, when you move away from God. There's this, God lets the sinful world take its course. And that sometimes the worst thing that God can do to us is give us exactly what we want. You want to go worship idols? There are consequences to that. And so here he is, and the king is finally at a breaking point. I mean, even a pagan king looks at this and goes, man, this is, this, this is just more than I can handle. And he said, may God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, uh, remains on his shoulders today. <clears throat> so what does he say? He's going to kill him, but it, he's basically saying it's his fault. It's his fault. Now this goes, and you could take this a million different directions, but it goes to show that a number of people, when they choose something, they choose to, to walk down a certain path in life, and then they're hit with those consequences, many times what they will do is spend the rest of their life blaming people. And we can't do that. Okay? We, I mean, we, they chose this sinful lifestyle. They chose to walk away from God. We're not talking about people who are trying to faithfully follow God and they make mistakes. We're talking about people who flat out reject Him. And then they say, it's the prophet's fault. And if we kill the prophet, you know, at least we'll get our last bit of revenge before we die. So verse 32, it says, Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. What they were doing, who knows, were they praying, were they studying? We kind of ran into some of this uh, a little bit earlier. It says, now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And so he says, there's somebody coming. Close the door quickly and hold it closed and don't let him get in. And while he was still speaking to them, the messenger came down to him and said, this trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? God is doing this. First of all, this is all convoluted, okay? <coughs> Because you've got a king who has abandoned God, and he says, you know, why should we wait for God anymore? We're at our wit's end. No question they're at their wit's end. But don't play it like you've been some righteous person all along. Okay? Don't play it that way. That's like a person who lives... Social media amazes me at so many levels because of what it reveals about human condition. But one that amazes me more than anything is a person who publicly declares through their behaviors and their decisions about which they post that they are doing things wholly contrary to what God has said and then have the audacity 
when something just slightly goes wrong in their life and they say, you know, God's not holding up his part. The last time you mentioned God was to curse him. You used his name flippantly as a swear. And so when, when I see this man say this, you know, we're tired of waiting on the Lord. You haven't honored him for a single second. What do you mean you're tired of waiting on him? But even further than that, it, it takes us a little bit more, a little bit deeper. In the sense that sometimes when things go wrong, we, we can get to a point to where we feel like we've got to act and we've got to move instead of waiting on God to do what God does. And, and this is not the only time this happens. You remember uh, when um, <clears throat> Saul is king and they're at, the, they're at war with the Philistines and Samuel has said, don't go to war until I come and, and make the offering. Saul, they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait. He says, he's not coming. No sooner has he finished making the offering, Saul assumes it on himself to make the offering, which he has no right to do. He's not the right lineage. He's not a priest. He makes the offering. As soon as he finishes making the offering, who strolls up? Samuel. On God's time. <clears throat> and so, there is this tendency to want to, with our human ingenuity and our human nature to, to fix when a lot of the times we need to acknowledge that we can't fix it and the more we try and fix it the more of a mess we're going to make of it and um, just at the moment where we feel like you know I've reached my breaking point that may be the very point that's usually I'm not going to say it may be that many times is the point that God wants us, he's been trying to get us to. Because when you're at your breaking point, you're finally about to admit you can't control it, you can't fix it, you can't do it. And it's not until you get to the end of yourself that you will then let God take over. Right? And because, <clears throat> as... One of my favorite preachers always says, God is not going to play tug of war with your problems, with you. Either you're going to give them to him, or you're going to try and fix them yourself. But he's not going to play tug of war with you saying, just give it to me, come on, give it to me, come on, give it to me. You're either going to hand them over, or you're going to have to deal with them on your own. Yes, sir. That's the assumption. Ben Hadad, probably the second, uh, most likely here. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That may be. That's, uh, that's a good point. It's going to come right here. Well, the question for maybe some who didn't hear was, Naaman, who's been healed in the previous chapter, is the captain of this army. And that's actually a question that a lot of people have, and a lot of reading that I've done is, the question comes up, where is Naaman? Is Naaman leading this raid? How much time has elapsed? What is going on? Um, and I don't know. And it's, there's a sense of irony as well, what we're going to see, and, and we're done for tonight, but what we're going to see is that the people who discover that the Syrians have fled are lepers. Uh, and they bring news of deliverance. So, uh, I don't know. I wish I knew where Naaman was right about now. Because uh, I've had the same question. Especially since the, the young maid that he captured, she was captured on a raid. And in this previous section, we've been talking about raids that they were making. And so, I don't know. I wish I had an answer. All right, we'll stop there and pick up on 
7 next week and watch Elisha's response.